Charleston, South Carolina, in our Southern Republican presidential debate. Let's get back to questioning the four gentlemen who would like to be the Republican nominee for president and the next president of the United States. Part of the political conversation during the crackling campaign in this great state this week, Senator Santorum, Speaker Gingrich said he thought it would be preferable for the conservative movement if one candidate, in his view, had a direct campaign against Governor Romney. He suggested, he didn't said it was up to you, but he suggested perhaps Governor Perry and Senator Santorum should get out of the race. In suggesting that, he said this, you don't have, quote, any of the knowledge for how to do something on this scale. What do you say to that? Uh, grandiosity has never been a problem with Newt Gingrich. He, he, he handles it very, very well. Uh, and that's really one of the issues here, folks. I mean, a month ago, he was saying that, oh, I'm, it's inevitable that I'm going to win the election, and it's, I'm destined to do it. Uh, I don't want a nominee that I have to worry about going out and looking at the paper the next day and figuring out what is he, worrying about what he's going to say next. And, and that's, that's what I think we're seeing here. Uh, for him to suggest that, uh, that someone who was tied for first and eventually won the Iowa caucuses and finished with twice as many votes as he did and finished ahead of him in, in New Hampshire in spite of the fact that he spent an enormous amount more money in both those places, plus had the most important endorsement in the state, the Manchester Union leader, and I was 10 points behind him a week before the election and then finished ahead of him. So I was 2-0 and oh coming into South Carolina, and I should get out of the race. Uh, these, are, these, are not, these are not cogent thoughts. I mean, and, 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 and let's just be honest. I mean, uh, I, Newt's, Newt's a friend, I love him, but at, at times you just got to, you know, sort of that, you know, worrisome moment uh, that, that something's going to pop and we can't afford that in a nominee. We need someone, I, I'm not the most flamboyant and I don't get the biggest applause lines here, but I'm steady, I'm solid, I'm not going to go out and do things that you're going to worry about, I'm going to be out there, I'm going to make Barack Obama the issue in this campaign. Mr. Speaker, take some time to respond as you do so. What exactly did you mean doesn't have any of the knowledge for how to do something on well, this scale? It's a very simple question. How big a scale of change do we want in Washington? I started working with Governor Reagan in 1974. I helped with Jack Kemp and others, the development of supply side economics in the late 70s. Uh, I participated in the 80s in an enormous project of economic growth. And with President Reagan's leadership, the American people created 16 million jobs. With President Reagan's leadership, the Soviet Union disappeared. I came back, I spent 16 years on a grandiose project called Creating a Republican Majority in the House. 16 years. And most of the Republican leaders in the House thought it was a joke. Even the night before the election, they thought it was a joke. And we created the first majority. We then worked for two solid years, reformed welfare. Two out of three people went back to work or went to school. We ultimately became the first re-elected Republican majority since 1928. We then went on to cut taxes for the first time in 16 years, the largest capital gains tax cut in American history. In the four years I was Speaker, the American people created 11 million new jobs. We balanced the budget for four consecutive years, the only time in your lifetime. You're right. I think grandiose thoughts. This is a grandiose country of big people doing big things, and we need leadership prepared to take on big projects. Okay. I will give Newt Gingrich his due on grandiose ideas and grandiose projects. I will not give him his, uh, his, his, his due on executing those projects, which is exactly what the President of the United States is supposed to do. Four years into his speakership, he was thrown out by the conservatives. It was a coup against him in three. I served with him. I was there. I knew what the problems were going on in the House of Representatives when Newt Gingrich was leading, this, leading there. It was an idea a minute. No discipline, no ability to be able to, to pull things together. I understand you're taking credit for the 1994 election, and you did have a lot of plans. As you know, I worked with you on those, and we had meetings early in the morning on many, many a week. And so we worked together on that. But you all have to have to admit that this freshman congressman who wasn't supposed to win a race came and did something you never did which has blew the lid off the biggest scandal to hit the Congress in 50 years. You knew about it. 
for, for 10 or 15 years because you told me you knew about it. And you did nothing because you didn't have the courage to stand up to your own leadership, the Democratic Speaker of the House, take to the floor of the Senate, demand the releasing of the checks that were being kited by members of Congress, risk your political career, risk your promotion within the ranks, and do what was right for America. And that had more or as much to do with the 1994 win as any plan that you put together. Mr. Speaker, respond. You know, campaigns are interesting experiences for all of us. And each of us writes a selective history that fits our interests. As a freshman in 1979, I moved to expel a member who was a convicted felon for the first time since 1917 against the wishes of our leadership. In the Page scandal in the 1980s, I moved and threatened to expel them unless they were punished much more severely against the wishes of the leadership. In the late 1980s, I initiated charges against the Speaker of the House, Jim Wright, at rather considerable risk for a backbench member. In 1990, I opposed the President of the United States of my own party when he tried to raise taxes. I said I actually thought he meant read my lips, and I led the fight against raising taxes, against the wishes of my party's leadership. I think long before uh, Rick came to Congress, I was busy being a rebel, creating the Conservative Opportunity Society, developing a plan to win a majority in the Congress. And if you talk to anybody who worked at the Congressional Campaign Committee from, jet, from December of 1978 on, for 16 years, I worked to help create the Republican Party nationally to become a majority. I worked to create GOPAC to train a majority. Those are just historic facts, even if they're inconvenient for Rick's campaign. Governor Romney, you're raising your hand to come in the conversation. I want to let you in the conversation, but also, as I do, you put an ad on the air paid by your campaign. This is not one of the super PAC ads. Your campaign calling the speaker an unreliable leader. Why? Well, let, let me go back and, and address first the, what you just heard. What, what you've listened to, in my view, and, and the speaker's rendition of history going back to 1978, his involvement in Washington, is, in my view, a perfect example of why we need to send to Washington someone who has not lived in Washington, but someone who's lived in the real streets of America, working in the private sector, who's led a business, who started a business, who helped lead the Olympics, who helped lead a state. We need to have someone outside Washington go to Washington. If we want people who spent their life and their career, most of their career in Washington, we have three people on the stage. Who, well, I take that back. We've got a doctor down here who spent most of his time in the, in the surgical suite. Well, not surgery, uh, the birthing suite. Uh, but, but I just, uh, I think America, I think America has to make a choice as to whether we're going to send people who spent their life in Washington to go uh, represent our country, or instead whether we're going to lead, have someone who goes who's been a leader in the private sector and knows how the real economy works at the grassroots level. Now, now you asked me a, an entirely different question. What do you, uh, what's, uh, Beats me. I don't know. Where are we at, let me, John? Let, let, me, let me tell you, let me tell you one, one of the things I find amusing it is, is, listening, is listening to how, how much credit is taken in Washington for what goes on in Main Street. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, you know, Mr. Speaker, it was, it was, you talk about all the things you did with Ronald Reagan and, and, and the Re Reagan Revolution and the jobs created during the Reagan years and so forth. I mean, I looked at the Reagan diary. You're mentioned once in Ronald Reagan's diary. And, and, it's, and in the diary, he says you had an idea in a meeting of, of young uh, uh, congressmen, and it wasn't a very good idea, and he dismissed it. That, that's the entire mention. And, I mean, he mentions George Bush a hundred times, he even mentions my dad once. So I, 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 th there's a sense that Washington is pulling the strings in America. But you know what? The free people of America pursuing their dreams and taking risk and going to school and working hard, those are the people that make America strong, not Washington. Quickly respond, Mr. Speaker. This is, this is probably a fundamental difference in our background and our experience. Under Jimmy Carter, we had the wrong laws, the wrong regulations, the wrong leadership, and we killed jobs, we had inflation, we went to 10.8% unemployment. Under Ronald Reagan, we had the right job, the right laws, the right regulators, the right leadership, we created 16 million new jobs. We then had two consecutive tax increases, one by a Republican, one by a Democrat, the economy stagnated. When I became Speaker, we went back to the Ronald Reagan playbook. Lower taxes, less regulation, more American energy, and 11 million jobs showed up. Now, I do think government can kill jobs, 
And I do think government can create the environment where entrepreneurs create jobs. And the truth is, you did very well under the rules that we created to make it easier for entrepreneurs to go out and do things. You'd have been much poorer if Jimmy Carter had remained president. Let, let, uh, let me just go let ahead, me, quickly. Let, let me just tell you, Mr. Speaker, you're a speaker four years. Right. Uh, I was in business 25 years. Right. So you're not going to get credit for my 25 years, number one. N num number two, I don't, recall, I don't recall a single day saying, oh, thank heavens, Washington is there for me. Th thank heavens. I, I, I said, please get out of my way. Let me start a business and put Americans to work. All right, let me, let me get out of the way for a second and go back out to our audience and take a question from an audience member. Sir? Uh, John Marcoux from the great city of Charleston. Uh, <laughs> Gentlemen, when will you re release your tax return specifically? 